I would like to move to our event uh, tonight and introduce to you our distinguished uh, panel speakers. Um, and um, I, I, I will go uh, straight to the bios uh, so we don't lose time. But I guess first we want to invite our panel speakers at the, at, at the panel. Please come over. This is, this is the moment. You can, you can get all set here. So welcome our panel speakers. So we'll have Mark here. We want to go on I will uh, be very brief, and uh, I, I'll only give you a summary. Uh, the full bios are on our uh, registration website, um, if you're interested. And I really encourage you to go there and check them out. Uh, <clears throat> I will start uh, uh, with Dr. Mark Cohen. Uh, Dr. Mark Cohen uh, is a licensed architect uh, who has uh, devoted his career to developing the new field of space architecture. Mark worked at, uh, at NASA Ames Research Center for 26 years, then at Northrop Grumman Aerospace Systems for four and a half years. At Ames, Mark became a founding member of the uh, Space Human Factors Office. Mark also patented the nodes and cupola of the space station. In 1995, he went uh, to the Space Projects Division to serve as the human engineering lead uh, for SOFIA. I hope I pronounced it right. There, he worked uh, also on Humans to Mars and the Habot Mobile Lunar Base. <clears throat> At Northrop Grumman, uh, Mark's major focus was the Constellation Program's Alter Lunar Lander, for which he was the Human System Integration Lead. Mark is now developing his company, Astrotecture. The goal is to provide expertise to the new emerging entrepreneurial space companies while continuing to lend support to NASA and the mainstream aerospace industry. Uh, welcome, Mark Cohen. Thank you very much. And I'm going to move to John. I'm going to do, uh, do all of the bios very quickly. <clears throat> uh, John Spencer, welcome. Uh, since the late uh, 1970s, uh, John has been pioneering the field of space um, architecture. He received design awards from NASA for early work on the Freedom Space Station. <clears throat> and was involved in the startup of SpaceAB. <clears throat> he has an extensive background in spaceport planning and design and designed the interiors for an underwater hab lab, still in operation, and a science base built in Antarctica. In 1992, he started pioneering the space tourism industry, basing it on the cruise line industry. <clears throat> and since the mid-90s, he has been <clears throat> designing his original concept for an orbital super yacht called Destiny. He is the author with Karen Rag of the first book on space tourism published in the US called Space Tourism, Do You Want to Go? He founded the Space Tourism Society in 1995 and is being quoted and appeared in over 100 TV and radio shows, newspaper and magazines, articles on space tourism. So welcome, John. <laughs> Next, uh, Jason Classy. Uh, Jason is an Emmy. Uh, nominated documentary producer and author. His productions have uh, premiered on television at the United Nations and events around the world. NASA, <clears throat> the International Astronautical Congress, and Paramount Pictures have published Jason's writings. Jason is a recipient of the Space Tourism Society's Orbit Award. He is the founder and president of Expedition Earth, a 501c3 corporation and space traveler, Inc. So welcome, Jason. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, uh, welcome Madhu Tangavelo. Uh, Madhu conducts the Graduate Space Exploration Architecture Concept uh, Synthesis Studio in the Department of Astronautical Engineering at USC. He also taught the Extreme Environment Habitation Design Seminar in the School of Architecture, where he's a graduate thesis advisor. He's a graduate of the inaugural summer session of the International Space University held at MIT in 1988. I find this very interesting. Yes, and, uh, <laughs> I'm glad to tell you we have faculty members here. And we do have faculty members. Uh, maybe you, 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 you will introduce <laughs> them. I, I will leave that to you. Um, 
Madhu's concepts have been uh, <clears throat> reviewed and appreciated by NASA, the National Research Council, <clears throat> the National Space Council, and his work has been presented before the National Academy of Sciences. He is a visiting lecturer at ISU and continues to present and publish original concepts in space system architectures. He is a co-author of the book, The Moon, Resources, Future Development and Colonization. He is a former vice chairman for education of the AIAA Los Angeles section. And uh, he has directed space exploration projects <clears throat> at the California Institute of Earth, Art, and Architecture. So welcome, Madhu. And uh, so it is now my pleasure to officially uh, leave the word to you. And uh, we will start with Dr. Marcoin. Thank you very much. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, just, just so everybody knows, uh, Nicola, I, I speak for how long, and they speak for how long, because we've had so many emails about this. 20 minutes, and then we'll have 10 minutes for questions. OK, all right, good. So how does this thing work? Let me start it for you. <coughs> I might have to step forward so I can see what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so. Do we go there so you can see better? Too? Whoop, where'd it go? You can stay, you can stay. Did I just close it? Uh, let me use left and right. Oh, left and right. Okay, all right. So um, the title of my talk tonight is New Space Architecture. And when I heard that I would be on the panel with John and Madhu, I had to add a reality-based approach, just so that you all would know the difference. <laughs> and, uh, um, so what do we mean by space architecture? Uh, you sure this thing works? OK, so the working definition of space architecture is the design of space living and working environments, structures and configurations, plus the systems that make them viable and safe to operate. I mean, that's the definition that I use. So what is new space? New space is where you do it on your own nickel and take all the risk on yourself without government pork. OK. There we go. OK. so. My company, Astrotecture, is the first professional practice of space architecture. And our focus is on research, planning, and design for all gravity regimes, extending the continuum of architecture from Earth to space, bringing space design down to Earth, and making the golden age of science fiction into a new reality. And I, I actually try to practice this, this bullet more than anything else, which is it's so hard to, to start a new business. And, make progress and, and win customers, that uh, the, there's a, a real danger to taking yourself too seriously. So my goal is to like re do this by reliving my own golden age of science fiction and the comic books that I loved and not take any of this too seriously. Otherwise, I completely crack up. <laughs> Whoops. So the first actual substantial contract was with the University of North Dakota at their EPSCOR grant, which I don't remember what EPSCOR stands for, but basically it's a grant to encourage competitive research at space, through space grant universities, where I'm a consultant for their integrated habitat for the human exploration of Moon and Mars. Then uh, I'm on two NIAC grants, the uh, Robotic Asteroid Prospector and the Water Walls Life Support Architecture. NIAC stands for NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts. So this is the situation in North Dakota, which is that there was a previous incumbent as consultant who designed this habitat for them with this uh, Takanaka Trust type um, space frame that was restraining the inflatable. And it was a nifty looking design, but the problem was that the cost of machining high strength forgings in titanium to make the nodes and struts would have exceeded the entire value of their grant to, to make this possible. So, so he left, and they hired me. And this, what they actually did um, before I came on board was they decided to make this 
frame out of a welded tubular steel. And here you see a couple views of that, of that habitat frame. And they hadn't decided what to do about the inflatable, and I'm actually still not sure what they're going to do. But this is what it looks like after I got involved and helped them with a lot of the um, issues of you know, outfitting and furnishing and life safety and you know, real basic architectural kinds of things. And uh, so anyway, um, they're planning to take this habitat and their rover for a field trial in September in the North Dakota Badlands. Now, as far as the rover goes, uh, Pablo de Leon, who's the, the lead on this grant um, at North Dakota, became enamored of the soup port concept, which is one of my patents from, <coughs> from my checkered career at Ames. And the basic concept is that you enter the suit through a pressure bulkhead, and it's basically an airlockless airlock where you don't have to pump down the airlock to save atmosphere or equalize pressure. Just the crew member can just hop in, close the hatch, bleed off the interstitial volume, and go. So, in the 90s, we built the Ames Hazmat vehicle, which was uh, we got an, the loan of an armored personnel carrier. And we built a couple of prototypes into the back of it. And this was funded by, um, by the Army and the Department of Energy and NASA. <coughs> While I was at North of Grumman, we, we pursued as an option a suit port for, uh, arrangement for the Altair airlock. <coughs> and some of you may have noticed during the President's first inauguration that the NASA float was the so-called lunar electric rover driven by astronauts in the, in the uh, inaugural parade. So here's the North Dakota version. Um, they actually design and make their own suits as well. And uh, this, I, I, I've never really understood why it has such small wheels. I brought this up time and again. But they seem to think that for the purpose of their simulation, this will be this will be sufficient. They're not they're not actually interested in in the problem of four, a four wheel or six wheel drive over extremely rough terrain. They're much more focused on the the interface with the suits and the suit port and the living inside the rover for some period of a few days. Okay, so <coughs> the next project I became engaged in was the. Uh, the NIAC project um, robotic asteroid prospector. And I put together a team which includes a mineral economist, Brad Blair, a uh, mission design and trajectories guy, Warren James, who lives nearby in Altadena, and a co I for mining and robotics, Chris Zachney of uh, Honeybee Robotics, who is also in Pasadena. So one of the things we did to develop our approach was, we call this our space infrastructural approach or strategy, was to try to figure out what would be the development of a market in, for space products in space. Because the fundamental economic divide is whether you're bringing the products back to Earth or whether you have a customer in space. And the purpose of this chart and, and the analysis that underlies it is to look at the whole issue of the customer in space. So not to go into too much detail here because it's probably too small for you to read, we set up a time interval of 15 years, baseline starting in 2010, and made some assumptions about how much money might be invested in developing space infrastructure. This is private money. and uh, I can't even read it myself. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the, the rate of investment as measured in NASA yearly budgets. So we took that as, as, as a sort of a fungible unit, if you will, that, that a NASA budget being about 16 to 17 billion dollars a year, how much of, how large a fraction of that would might be invested per year by private parties in space infrastructure development. The number of people living in space with there being six 
on the space station around the end of 2010. And that doubling or increasing by a little more than doubling or it actually grows exponentially on this chart. How many would be living in space? And then where, what kinds of products or commodities and where they might be consumed? And the products we were looking at were um, water, platinum group metals or PGMs, scientific samples, um, regolith for soil, regolith for radiation shielding, and uh, metals for structural materials. Now, in our mining approach, we have this chart um, where what we call it our hierarchy of resources and markets, with the idea of focusing on an asteroid as the source. There are essentially three categories of product, which are free water, bound water, and metal powder on the surface. We've already concluded that it's far too energy intensive and expensive to actually drill, you know, solid iron or other metal deposits. But there are plenty of um, <coughs> plenty of asteroids like Itakawa that um, have a lot of a lot of loose material on the surface. So in the first tier you have the, the, the materials, then each has a extraction regime and each corresponds to a particular market for products made from those materials. So in terms of mission design, the key points are that we're trying to devise a mission architecture that can profitably return asteroid material to cislunar space. And that, by that, we, we basically mean an Earth-Moon Lagrange point. And so our operations are focused on the use of a gateway station at L1 or L2. Okay, so um, in terms of the spacecraft design, we want to design a, a vehicle that can fly a variety of missions with minimum modifications. And the principal modification we're, we're, we're trying to focus on is just how many, more, how many tanks of propellant you need, how much tank, if it's a, if it's a, a very uh, difficult trajectory, long mission, you have more propellant. If it's a shorter mission, less difficult, you have less propellant. And we're baselining a solar propulsion, a solar thermal propulsion system, which also pro will provide us with process heat for resource extraction and processing. And the uh, spacecraft is intended to be usable and based at an EML point. So this is a view of the spacecraft as uh, of about two weeks ago where we were. You can see on the right the large parabolic concentrators, which will focus light through those holes in the primary mirror into um, a system of mirrors and direct it towards the solar thermal engine. You see the, the nozzle or the, I forget what you call it, the, 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 the bugling out at the end of the nozzle there. The, 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 the what? The red Oh, does this, this actually work? Okay, so, so anyway, um, maybe it'll help if I get a little closer. So, I can't, still can't see it. But anyway, so those two small brownish tanks are the propellant tanks to run this mission. Now, they're water. Use water as a fuel. We can extract water from the asteroids, from carbonaceous chondrites and perhaps other asteroids. And our calculation to do a NEA mission, near-Earth asteroid mission, that's about how much water we need. It's a very dense fuel compared to liquid oxygen or liquid hydrogen. And um, we bring back the water in those large spherical tanks, you see. Um, we have solar panels on the solar array uh, on that, it's called on solar array drive. Those are for, that's for spacecraft bus power because you need a small amount of power in the, in the tens of watts or hundreds of watts range to operate the spacecraft while in cruise mode. You don't need to crank up a megawatt of solar parabolic concentrator. And these little multi-legged spacecraft you see floating around are honeybees concept that they call spiders which are small robotic spacecraft free flyers that can 
jump off the, the main spacecraft and attach themselves to an asteroid or other object. Now, what this actually shows um, with a, a body of material inside those, that in, those grippers, that enclosure, or that we call them capture linkages in this slide, uh, is, is really meant to be a uh, technology test where we would go out and try to find a 10 or 15 meter diameter asteroid and synchronize with its rotation, and grab onto it, and try extracting, try, try our mining and extraction technologies, <coughs> which Honeybee is providing. Um, but that is not the way we, we really expect to, um, to operate in the long term, because if you look at the size of the water storage tanks or the, the payload we hope to bring back to sell or have some or use else otherwise, um, you're not going to get that much water out of, out of an asteroid this size. In fact, we expect that asteroids will have 1 to 3 percent water content in a carbonaceous chondrite. So, that is, that is extractable free water. Bound water is another question. We're not actually really looking at bound water yet. So um, what we intend to do is go to a much larger asteroid, attach, and use the spiders to bring chunks of material back and put it in the, um, put it in the system. So this is, this is a set of, of views. You can see that we have radiators on the backs of the uh, parabolic concentrators, and they actually have to be a lot deeper than, than they're drawn. And you can see this enclosure where we would enclose the asteroid or, or the materials that we brought back. And actually, I, I believe that when we get to the point of actually attaching onto a larger asteroid at the pole, we will have a, have a smaller hopper. So this diagram shows how the uh, the solar thermal system works, which is that you see the, the red lines representing the light coming from the, the backs of the, the parabolic concentrators, and they converge on the heat exchanger part of the solar thermal engine for propelling the engine when that's what you're using. When you, once you have attached to an asteroid, you're no longer using that engine, and the, the light, the concentrated light is reflected down the shaft of the truss to the, uh, the mining processing fa uh, facility. And thereby, that way we get the process heat that we need. We also retain the option of um, generating power with, say, a Stirling engine and generating up to a megawatt of power for um, a process that might use electrodes to, to heat specific focused areas or, or whatever. Whoops. So, so this, this cartoon shows the, uh, the sequence where you approach an asteroid, match the speed and rotation rate, capture it with the linkages. This is, again, this is just the technology testing phase. Inflate airbags within the containment to constrain the asteroid and then do the mining processing. And, and I, I'm not showing any honeybees materials tonight that show their, their techniques for um, extracting water. And of course, we would be interested in mining the Martian moons, which are basically captured asteroids. They appear to both be, Phobos and Deimos appear to both be carbonaceous chondrites, I believe. OK, so the third project, water walls. Well, this is actually our most hotly debated topic, which is that we have some people that say all you need is to go after a 10-meter asteroid. Others want it to be 25 or 30 meters. I personally, I think that's the wrong question. Um, I think the real question is, what's a reasonable s size scoop or chunk of material to collect and put into the, into the process? And I, I don't think it's realistic to go after a small asteroid to, to waste the whole mission logistics and propellant and everything to go after a relatively small asteroid that you know you cannot come close to filling your payload tanks from. So um, I, I think in our next iteration, we're going to be looking at some sort of intake hopper that you can put uh, 
dust, granulated material, and maybe small rocks into, and uh, contain it and, and pass it through pneumatically or um, through some other means to where it's going to be heated and you're going to extract water or, or metals or whatever. So, um, water balls. This project, uh, ha the principal investigator is Michael Flynn at NASA Ames Research Center in the bioengineering branch. He's a life support engineer. And Renee Matosian is working with me at Astrotecture on this project. And we also have Sherwin Gormley, who's our uh, our waste processing expert for urine to water and black water solids, effluent, and Rocco Mancinelli, who grows our algae. So the idea of this project is to take a passive approach to have equipment that's not highly mechanical, doesn't use a lot of power, and is not failure prone like the life support systems we presently have on spacecraft, including ISS. But we're looking for something that's passive, highly reliable, massively redundant. So an example of this technology is in the hydration technologies XPAC, which is an is item where you can pour contaminated water or urine in one side and get clean drinking water out the other. It's completely passive. It's reusable. Um, or at least 10 times, and uh, that's, that's a model of what we're talking about using forward osmosis processing. We, uh, Michael Flynn and Scott Howe at JPL and Joe Chambliss at JSC put together a flight experiment using one of these forward osmosis bags as a, a process test to see how zero gravity would affect, the, or microgravity would affect the process. And they found that it operates at about 50% efficiency as in 1G when you have convection flows that aid the, the osmotic process. But that's not a showstopper. In, in fact, from our point of view, to achieve radiation shielding, we love mass. You know? So if you have a, a good basis for needing more mass, oh, one minute. OK, I better move along here. Oops. So. In terms of the architecture, we started out with a functional flow diagram. And all of this is in, uh, a lot of this is in the paper I published at the GLEX conference. But the, the central item is, uh, is an organic uh, fuel cell We're using a proton exchange membrane that you, we gen actually generate power while doing the air revitalization, humidity and thermal control, solids, waste processing, algae growth and uh, water processing. And we did an analysis of the um, functions against processes. And one of the things that we learned was that the nitrogen cycles, the nitrogen economy, are the most cross-cutting. And they actually emerge as a key to sizing everything. Now, this is the most recent diagram that Renee did. It's our process block integration diagram. And what we did was we consolidated everything into four process blocks, which are climate control, contaminant control, air revitalization, and power and waste. And if anyone wants to ask detailed questions, I'll get you later. So this is what our early concepts for a water walls life support module look like. Uh, you can see we have people at Ames who grow algae. And uh, this this type of module in integrates the, the different functions. So this is where we were when we started. We, there was very little that had been funded, although the forward osmosis membrane technology had been developed at Ames five to 10 years ago. This is the current funded projects, which you see the water walls, NIAC in the upper left. And there's two others on the lower left that do waste processing. And uh, we have a AIMS d director's discretionary matching fund for CO2 sequestration. And we have more things proposed. And I'll end with this slide, which is not space per se, but it's a concept which extends the uh, osmotic process to 
a terrestrial application, which is wastewater secondary treatment, where we can actually produce cleaner water to discharge to the environment and generate power through a turbine using the elevated hydrostatic pressure. It's like a low head hydro system. Questions? Good evening, everyone. Um, Nicola, thank you for setting this up, and thank you for the AIAA hosting these monthly meetings. They're a real service uh, to the space community. I'm going to zip through this pretty fast, so if you have seatbelts, now's the time to put them on. And I've divided my presentation into two parts. The first gets into what I define as space experience, uh, and the second gets into a little bit of a history over the last 35 years of my involvement in uh, space architecture. So we're going to be showing some pretty interesting projects. But this is, as it says, my most important point from my perspective and the, the world that I live in is that we are in what I call the space experience business. And that's one of the reasons we'll expect large-scale financing to continue to come into the private space enterprise tourism industry because people want unique experiences, and space is by far the most unique experience. Uh, since 1982, I've been a proponent, I think I'm really the first one, of, of the cruise line industry being the business and marketing model for building a vibrant space tourism industry. And that's because cruise ships exist to take people out into an extreme environment, the ocean, to have a good time and to make a profit. Uh, actually, I cut this out of a cruise, uh, cruise ship brochure back then because we didn't have personal computers. But this image over the years has become kind of famous around the world in terms of the space tourism arena because it really symbolizes the long-term direction we intend to take. Because of my long-term involvement in this, my definition of the space experience has really evolved over the years into three key mediums. There's real space flight, there's Earth-based simulation, uh, visitor Center, NASA, Visitor Center, Space Camps, and then there's TVs, movies, and games. And this is really a wonderful synergy between these three mediums of real Earth-based simulation and movies and TV that really are contributing to expanding what I call the space experience economy. Now, if you take just a quick second, please read this. I'd like to uh, bring this up as kind of a uh, force field shield for me because I'm going to be showing you some pretty wild concepts coming up. And in fact, there's my design for an orbital super yacht called Destiny. I'm very convinced this will happen because on the model of yachts, they exist for pride and prestige and social setting. It's not a profit-oriented venture. It's really a social profit venture. That's her profile. 300 foot long, about 10 passengers, six crew members. The sails collect solar energy, radiate the energy to charging stations, uh, radiate heat away. And I designed this to be a beautiful spaceship because if you're going to spend four or five or six billion dollars on your orbital super yacht, she's got to look very good. At the center, approximately, if you can see that, there's a 60 foot diameter float sphere, probably about the size of this room in terms of diameter. And inside that, you're going to have a whole variety of fun, to fun things and toys. And this is my equivalent of a hot tub in outer space in zero gravity. Of course, water in zero gravity forms a sphere. So we're going to basically have our hot tubs as a sphere. Uh, imagine having weddings inside of the float sphere. Oops. This thing is kind of sensitive. Uh, or just contemplating the fact that you're in space looking at the beautiful Earth in your private cabin. This is another one of my concepts and projects, and I have quite a bit of interest from some movie producer friends of mine have done some major projects. And this is a concept of a ro road race around the entire moon with a billion dollar grand prize. Our movie guys want to make this right now, and uh, we're starting to work on this. Now, why do I think a lot of these things are gonna happen? If you take a second, please read this list. So 
So we have 10 billionaires who are financing the private space enterprise tourism industry. There's more that are going to come online after this summer. Some of these are world famous and they started a whole new industries and their prestige, political power and financial wealth gives a lot of clout to the idea that private space enterprise is going to become a key industry worldwide. And this is uh, the end of this first part of the presentation. This is my favorite quote. And the fact that you're all here, basically you're explorers and pioneers in your own right because you're coming to these kinds of meetings where we're talking about these future-oriented concepts. Now we're gonna take a little trip backwards in time from today to going back 35 years in terms of my involvement with space architecture. This is what I call extreme design. So I've been involved in projects that have been designed and built that have flown in space, then built and operate underwater, and been built uh, in Antarctica. Uh, also, I've done a lot of work on uh, spaceports. Uh, this one was not built in Christmas Island, but uh, we came close. Uh, this is another extension of my definition of space architecture, where you're looking at creating a re reproduction of the science base at Deben Island in a, a site that I control in the Mojave Desert, a replica of the space, or rather the Mars Institute simulation facility. If we build this, and we can do it, we want to do it, we just haven't had time, it'll allow the Mars Institute to operate their simulation programs year-round and preparing for actually deploying to the real site that's, that's 900 miles south of the North Pole. Uh, I had a contract to design the interiors of the zero-gravity aircraft. We developed a whole program and protocol for that, designed the ground facilities, and right now over 7,000 people have actually flown on this aircraft. And people have had a great time doing that. I did a lot of work with Bob Bigelow from Bigelow Aerospace. Uh, I was the first space person he actually met in 1999. And we developed a whole range of concepts and ideas for his uh, orbital facilities, eventually lunar bases, and so forth. Some of them I still can't show because they're proprietary. But uh, working with Bob was great because he actually made his money in the hotel industry. And since I designed themed resorts, we hit it off and really can speak the same language. And that's the book I wrote, Space Tourism, Do You Want to Go? And in it, I really use my architectural background to think about space in the same way you might think about a city. In terms of zoning, this is like far vision of what might happen. Where do you locate certain functions together? And it was the first time I really put together my design for the orbital super yacht that's at the bottom of that page. Uh, Buzz Aldrin and I are really good friends for over 25 years. I've done a lot of design work with him. He's actually a space architect, in fact, designing all kinds of vehicles and mission planning and concepts. And we always like to build these architectural models. It's actually fun being an architect, so you can build models all the time, uh, to look at his configuration for different space station designs. Uh, also, this is actually an interesting story. Uh, I know Jim Cameron, uh, working on a couple of projects with him, and one of them was doing mission planning and spacecraft design for a Mars movie he wanted to do in the year 2000. So between 2000 and 2001, Buzz and I worked with Jim, whose office is over in Santa Monica, on his Mars mission spacecraft and then uh, space, uh, Mars base. He dropped doing the movie project, and then years later, when uh, we were sitting there watching Avatar, I realized that he had repurposed the ship that we had basically designed and fixed it up a little bit for the movie. He owned all the designs, so that was actually kind of cool. And how many people here know what Space Hab is? Please raise your hand. Uh, quite a few. This was really an extraordinary experience and pioneering effort. It really started in 1982, where Bob Citron, who had a company called Space Travel Company, wanted to design a, f a module filling up the entire cargo bay of the space shuttle. After a while, we realized we really couldn't do that, so it kept getting scaled back smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually, we came up with a module that's just one uh, unit, uh, what we call one unit wide. So from concept to this actually being built, this is, it flew, I think, 22 times, the first time in 1993. And that picture uh, is 1985. If you can see, this is, uh, is Bob Citron is right there. That's me with more hair. And that's uh, one of my design fellows. And Tom Taylor, so the Space Hat patent is Tom Taylor and Bob Citron. These were the first models ever built of Space Hab. And that's the first sketch ever built, or ever done, which I did myself, 
uh, of the idea. So it's fun being involved in the beginning of these projects. You never know where they're going to go, but um, I've been involved in a number of projects where we've actually got things built in these extreme environments. Space Hab was great because it was a private enterprise company started by non-aerospace engineers, received hundreds of millions of dollars in funding, went public, uh, and really provided an important service for the, the space shuttle and the space community. Uh, I just like showing this interior construction. And uh, I got involved, this is through Mark uh, Cohen, uh, on doing design work for planning inside of the uh, Freedom Space Station. This was 90, I mean, 1984, 85, 86 era. I would say 85, 86, 87 era. And this was through NASA Ames through Mark's Human Factors Department. And we did a lot of interior planning and design and built models, flew some experimental stuff. Uh, we we're also very involved in what's called the aft cargo carrier. So I'm really going back in time. This is like 1982 or so. Uh, this would fit on the back of the space shuttle external fuel tank. We really looked at how do you create a habitation module on the back of the tank so the tank could be taken into space and uh, utilized. And going way back, 1999, I mean 1979, was using the space shuttle fuel tank in a torus shape, that's round shape, this was an invention of Tom Taylor, who also worked on Space Hab. And this was a fun, great thing for a young architect to be involved with because the tank was so big, it really had volumes and space in it. This was designed for 200 people, and it was a wonderful way of really getting into thinking about what is space architecture? How do I take those talents and mix them up with the science and the space environment? And we actually had floor plans, which was a lot of fun doing, cross sections. But my first space project was in 1978 when I was working on my master's program in School of Architecture. And it was the design of a 10,000 person space colony concept. And I think I'm probably the first person ever to look at designing a low gravity apartment complex within this whole thing. So to wrap up, um, as I said, we're in what I feel is the space experience business. It's an exciting field to be involved with, with space architecture. It's an important field because more and more people and from a greater variety of disciplines and backgrounds and education will be going into space over time. And I think it's a real pioneering effort. So the bottom line is I, I really love being a space architect. Thank you very much. I want to thank everybody for showing up tonight and uh, for Nicola for inviting me to uh, speak with these amazing space architects. Now, I'm not an architect, I'm not a rocket scientist, and I'm not an astronaut like uh, Buzz Aldrin, but he wrote the foreword to my book. And this is, going to be honest, it's not a technical treatise. It's really written for a, a general audience. I'm just a guy who grew up and always dreamed of going to space as a kid even when I was walking on this frozen river in Iowa and I was just looking up at the moon thinking how Buzz Aldrin had just landed there a few months earlier when the uh, ice broke from underneath my feet. I fell right through and I just was, saw the current was sweeping me away and I saw this hole disappearing in front of me. So I just, I swam like hell. I got under the edge of that ice and uh, I just said, wow, I'm really, looked up the Milky Way and asked myself, why am I here? Which is, I think a question that humans have been asking themselves for thousands of years. And I think one of the answers to that might be another question is maybe it is to go to space. There are too many people on Earth buying for limited resources, destroying the environment. And a natural or man-made disaster could obviously happen at any time without much warning at all. But fortunately, there are people like uh, these gentlemen in this room and forward thinkers are designing missions and spacecraft that can sustain life in space. Like uh, Dennis Tito here, the first space tourist in his uh, Inspiration Mars mission. Now, I don't have the wherewithal of Dennis Tito, so in my book I envisioned a, a virtual adventure to Mars 
and this would depart Earth on July 4th, 2099. The concept is really to just take six people, land them at a uh, small outpost near the Mars no North, North Pole, uh, where they would join another handful of people already there in the search for life, and they'd learn to live on another planet. So this book is designed as a little journey, and each chapter is a leg of our journey. And the first chapter, Space Traveling Every Day, really is best summed up by Buckminster Fuller and his concept of Earth as spaceship Earth, and the fact that we already are space travelers. Uh, along with John and these other architects, Bucky Fuller was a real inspiration to me as an architect because he was the one guy that combined the essential shapes of Earth architecture. You know, it'd be angles, triangles, and rectangles. It's like why we have legs to stand up against gravity with, with the uh, fundamental shapes of space, spheres, and spirals. Which, that's what creates that essence of weightlessness. As we see in this chapter, here you see Anusha Ansari, the first female space tourist, and uh, she's just grinning from ear to ear. And you got Stephen Hawking up there, who's normally confined to a, a wheelchair and can't move a muscle in his body, but he's just all smiles. And uh, you've got this Russian guy down below who's really happy he's making a ton of money throwing these Americans around. <laughs> <laughs> but weightlessness, really, it's, it's a form of free fall in a microgravity environment. And it induces a neutral body posture. Now, from an architectural standpoint, this was a really a neat image to me. Uh, it was one of, uh, by NASA's Brand Griffin, showing the body in this neutral posture. What it does, it says that whether you're floating underwater or in space, you know, the body assumes this neutral posture. The need for legs to stand up against gravity is really all but eliminated. And I best exemplified by an uh, underwater film I made in my early days. And it was, I had the privilege of working with the handicapped scuba divers. Now, these people were just like, just like you and I, except they didn't you know, have the use of their legs. They didn't have legs in some cases. But it was really amazing to take them down to the water's edge, and you'd put scuba tanks on them, and they would just all of a sudden be released from gravity and they would just find a new kind of freedom that they didn't have when the, in normal life. There's this one guy, we'd actually wheel him down in a wheelchair to a kelp bed, and he would simply float up out of this wheelchair, and he was just like an astronaut. It was really inspiring. There's actually a little music here, but that's all right. We don't need that. So that brings us to uh, the fifth chapter, where we really look at Earth as a biosphere. And just as the Earth is a self-contained biosphere, well, so are architectural structures like Biosphere 2 in Arizona and the International Space Station. Because let's face it, spacecraft really are their artificial biospheres designed to sustain the delicate balances of life. And on a design note, I remember John and I were at a meeting with a NASA administrator, and he was talking about the linear design of the space station and how it had the one characteristic, it had a flexing action. So when a spaceship would dock with it, you know, you'd get this little bit of a flexing action. Which brought me to think is is exemplified in this study by John in the early days that these basic shapes of spheres and triangles really are number one, they're conducive to this neutral body posture that a body gets in weightlessness. And two, they provide rigidity within the structure itself, as you as I learned in by this early study of Mark Cohen. So basically, these inspired me to create this kind of symbolic design of the craft we take in our journey called the Cosmic Sea. And it's really nothing but off the Which brings us to the seventh leg of our journey where we land, live, and learn to thrive on Mars. 
And I remember Ray Bradbury saying when the Viking lander first landed on Mars, and he goes, you know, there is life on Mars, and it is us. It is us. And uh, we're almost home, but on our way home, we take a little left turn on this chapter into the minds of Einstein and Hawking and the mysteries of black holes, God particles, and string theories. Now, these were interesting to me because many of these theories share a unique mathematical equation or another shape, and that's called known as the golden spiral. And you find it in your fingerprints, you find it in nature and nautilus shells, you find it in DNA, you even find it in art where it's known as the rule of thirds. said uh, on just as he stepped off the platform on his historic space jump, I'm coming home. And as the heroes in our own journeys, you know, I think our task is to return home, apply the knowledge we learn from people like this, all these space architects and whatever it is, and just apply it to our own lives and try to make the world a, a better place. Thank you very much. again and again, that it's all about the hero's return. And I tend to agree with that. I mean, you know, all of these things that we do is about doing these extraordinary things and then longing for home and coming back home. I mean, that's a beautiful thing, I think, about, uh, about it all. Anyhow, uh, my turn now. And I get a few extra minutes because I'm going to be talking for, um, for my colleague, Anders. Uh, that is probably the weirdest uh, title screen I ever did. Uh, uh, but uh, then uh, it's the end of the lectures, so I thought you, you really need a, a break from all the, uh, uh, all the heavy stuff you saw. Uh, I teach a course at the University of Southern California, and I'm glad to see that some of my students are here today. Can you put your hands up who've taken my class? Gosh, that's great. I, I'm so happy that you think you can face me again after all the terrible things we went through. <laughs> great. Uh, um, uh, and then I also want to congratulate perhaps one of the older members in the, uh, in the group here. Jim Burke is here. Do you know if he's still here? Yes, I see him. I see him right there. Jim is special because. Uh, Because besides being a, 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 a very, very sharp uh, aerospace engineer, he's also part of the mafia that we call the International Space University. How many know about that? That's right, good. OK, so let's, let's proceed now. Um, so concept creation, uh, from nothing to everything, what is it about? I'm glad that our speakers introduced the subject in many different angles. And now we are about to see. Uh, yet another one. What do I press to go like that? Yeah, right. Good. Now, um, uh, every time I talk about about uh, uh, um, architecture, people look at me and say, "Do you know that uh, you are not the top of the food chain? That philosophies, 
visions and so on and so forth come before you guys? I, I don't have an answer for this. I think you have philosophies followed by visions and they produce architectures and you know what? Engineers make these architectures real. And once in a while, engineers send messages up the chain to philosophy and say, hey, you gotta change your course a bit. And you, most often you get damped down, but that's okay. But do, now, do you, do you the mic? oh, okay, good, I'll be close to this. So uh, we went to the School of Architecture the other day and said, listen, we want to build a landing pad on the moon. And they look at me and go like, just one? And I say, yeah, that should be bad enough. Uh, okay. And we did not provide them a program. We did not give them any indications. We showed them a couple of slides of uh, landers. Three days later, they called and said, we have a design for you. This is what architects do for a living. They dream, they imagine, they visualize, they put it in print, and you know what? They persuade. They call you back at the middle of the night and say, did you like it? Or did you not like it? I'm giving it to somebody else. You know, architecture is the profession that uh, has been kind of uh, misportrayed, in my opinion. But architects do some amazing things. And I've spent about 20 years now trying to get the School of Architecture to talk to the School of Engineering. And you're about to see some of the slides that, that uh, we, we keep, keep developing. Everybody knows this from your high school, high school uh, uh, physics about vectors and how you, how you, how you make a vehicle turn and, and get you a landing site. So these were the slides that I quickly put up together and sent back to the School of Architecture and said, I think you need a bit of revision here. You need a little more engagement before we know what's going on. So I showed him that that's how you land. And then from the theory, you get to practice and you start to see it's a way different animal. You start to see how the vehicle tilts, turns, and comes over for a soft landing because there are people in it. You see? And you'll notice that when you really start looking at how a lunar landing happens, it is a very, very scary experience for a tourist. And so you need to be prepared to know that any time you're flying onto the lunar surface, you're going so fast and so low to the ground, it is a very shallow approach, all in the, uh, in the idea of saving a itty bitty amount of fuel. Compared to landing, the launch is very, very easy. Can you hear me if I walk here? Because I don't want to carry that because it's, it, it, there's a contact problem. Oh, you do, okay, good. Is that good? Okay, so uh, compared to a landing, a takeoff, a liftoff is very, very simple and very easy to do, provided the engine fires on time. Right. Now, we studied a little bit about the, the, uh, the camera images that came down from uh, uh, the Japanese space program and realized that, you know, when you land paying tourists, you're not going to scare them to death flying them at those kind of low angles, and suddenly say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna stop right now. Oh boy, you're gonna have some serious problems, you know? So uh, we looked at stuff and decided that we have to do this um, in a very, very <laughs> civilized manner. Um, so we said, the places to land really should be visible to the pilot, not just for a minute and three seconds, but for perhaps from the time you are in orbit and you come, come down. <clears throat> we located some interesting spots, mountain tops. And uh, that's what it looks like from the um, LOR imagery, uh, the, the, the um, LRO imagery that comes out, uh, that, that's out there now. You can go take a look. Mountains look very pretty on the moon. And then 
we developed some schematic drawings about what a landing pad might need. You know, when they come down at certain times of day or certain times of night, you won't be able to see anything. So you got to light up, the, light up the place, just like you would a landing um, a strip here at LAX or any place else. And now we are at this point. Now we have decided that the landing pad is going to look a little more, little more agreeable, but still a lot of holes. And we hope to clean that up in the coming weeks and months. It's part of NASA's NIAC program. And we are busy trying to do a simulation of sorts in the desert in Arizona. A little bit of history of the um, ASTE 527 studio that I conduct. This is going to be boring for my students here, but uh, we have to do it. I got kicked out of USC to go to MIT for a summer. And everybody there was a number cruncher or um, a computer whiz, and they were all busy working what's called the International Space University's inaugural summer session. Jim, are you listening? I hope he is. Good. So, uh, um, and, and you won't believe it. I can even see at the right end Michael Potter, who is sitting right there. So, so the International Space University is a mafia of sorts that reports back and, and there's a lot of feedback going on. Um, you know, so anyhow, everybody was number crunching, and I was the only guy who could draw, or at least thought I could draw. So I started sticking these things on the wall. Over a period of two or three days, rumors started going around that there is a crazy architect here. He's an architecture student. He has no idea whatsoever about reality. Um, you know, so be careful when you discuss with them, talk. But the fact of the matter is I have a bachelor's degree in engineering, and uh, it just so happens that I'm in love with architecture. So I took all of those drawings back, and I put them into my thesis uh, for my graduation. That is the model of my thesis. And the idea was very, very simple. You take the model, you take the modules of the International Space Station, or parts of it, put them all together into a giant spaceship, and fly them down as one big lunar base. I asked Buzz Aldrin, who is not in the crowd today, and he said he thought a great deal, and he said, Madhu, I like this idea, but I'd rather watch this landing from a faraway place. <laughs> So that kind of gave me some idea what's going on. So that's what a very large lunar lander might look like. It's not as impossible as you think it, uh, it might, might, it is. But then I gave that picture off to my daughter the other day and said, put some uh, emblems and NASA stuff and so on and so forth. She goes out there and puts up this and sends it back to me and says, Dad, the agency is not going anywhere. If you want to have something happen, you have to have dividend-paying industry work with spacecraft and space projects. And therefore, we found Coca-Cola landing on the moon. You'll see how it works. And so, back to the course. Once I put my thesis together, the uh, uh, dean of engineering called me to lunch and which was a good lunch, called me and said, hey, would you like to put a curriculum together um, you know, for the engineering school? It is uh, 15 weeks long. It's three units. We use whatever we can beg, borrow, or steal from the architecture profession. And the prerequisite happens to be that you need to have some engineering fundamentals. And uh, the way we we approach it is to use the topic studio model. That is, you pick a topic, and then you bring in people to talk about their own ideas, their own interesting things that are somehow correlated or connected with the topic at hand. And I'm glad to tell you, all of the panelists, except Jason, uh, have been willing victims. I hope Jason will come in one day, too. So we teach them visualization techniques. 
but a lot of debate and discussion. And it is offered now through the distance education network. And that is really um, a, an internet-based education network. So you can take this course, in theory at least, from your, from your workplace or from your home. Dive in, and you can have a good time. Now, some of the things that now I'm sure that uh, one of my students in the class was the great Dr. Stuppy, who is with us today. Now, I'm a little bit, little bit trepid, uh, I have a little bit of trepidation going into this area. Um, it is biology. Now, one of the things that we do is try to practice the critical skill of connections, which is what architects do all the time. They're trying what's called associative logic, connecting things with one thing to the other, to the other, to the other, to see if it all makes sense to bring about a grand synthesis. We do this all the time, in fact, <laughs> you know, just, just going around doing our daily work, we do it all the time. It's only when you have some differential equations, you stop thinking and start thinking straight. But for most part of our lives, we do connect and make connections. We look for patterns, and we apply heuristics. We've got 10 minutes, 5 minutes. Okay, good. So uh, um, what are heuristics? Heuristics are simple things that are common sense indications of how you think certain things should happen. For instance, there is a famous surgeon's heuristic which goes that the eye refuses to see what the mind cannot understand. And many times, this is the case with higher levels of technologies, too. And uh, we discuss these things and come with common models and quilting, quilting, patching things together to make it happen, all very quickly. Which brings me to another area of interest, which is the tool that we use, all of us use, in our daily lives, and that is our brain. The brain is the ultimate connection machine. Right in the heart between the two hemispheres is probably the most advanced connection link between the two sides of the brain. It is called the corpus callosum. And uh, again, I will tell you this. When you dissect a brain, I hope uh, Jill Bolte Taylor, Mike was here, she would have told us, given us much better detail on this. When you dissect the brain, you'll see that the corpus callosum in the female gender, in, in half our species, is much larger than it is in the males. I do not know if this is by accident, but my students, many of them uh, female, tend to perform better in my class. Synthetic mindset. I'll let you read this over time, but one of my favorite authors is Tolstoy. And he wrote a little book. He had already published his famous works, and he thought he was a failure midlife crisis. And uh, he wrote up a book about 80 pages long. It's very small. It's called The Confessions. How many of you have read it? It's free and it's on the internet. Pick it up. It is the most incredible account of a human in his 50s who thinks he's a failure and he wants to commit suicide, but at the same time he's afraid to die. And then he puts down this very interesting ideas about the mind of the human. It expands, to, he says, on the one end is mathematics, pure mathematics, and on the other is metaphysics. That is, you have religion on one end and theology on one hand, and you have pure mathematics on the other. And we span this entire length, and yet we don't know the reason for our existence. So this is what's worrying me. Or Lawrence of Arabia, who talked about dreaming. 
He said, beware those guys who dream during the middle of the day because they can make things happen. Scare the hell out of you, you know? And as you can see, uh, <laughs> we have problems now in the same area that, uh, uh, that he is caused to have uh, uh, done a lot of action in. Damascus, it looks like all roads lead to Damascus now. That is our textbook, which brings me to the point that uh, I would like to share with you I have a copy. Yes, Nicola. Maybe we can do the auction at the very end after the question. Good. So this is our textbook. And I was going to quickly run over some slides from here. If you give me time, Nicola. Yeah, maybe we have, really have a couple of minutes. OK, good. Because I thought I was going to also handle uh, Anders. Good. OK, good. There you go. So I'm going to show you some of these uh, 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 ideas that came out in our uh, Moon book. The edition one on the left is now um, a collector's item. Don't buy it on the internet. <laughs> and uh, uh, the moon book is what we use in the, in the school. Uh, pure, the idea is to generate, uh, to, to get people to get inspired to do creative things. Uh, the first idea that has been circulating a long time is the idea that EVA is a very, very hard thing to do. Astronauts smile uh, usually, but most of the time they are, they are uh, breaking their nails and, and losing their fingernails uh, inside their gloves. And they come out looking very bloody at the end of a EVA activity. So what is one way to avoid that? And that is to, to have a bell of sorts where people can climb in and do their work. Now, you're going to say, oh, that's going to blow away. That's going to blow away at about, about, um, about uh, you know, um, it's going to launch the entire, uh, <laughs> the entire rover into orbit. You know what? That, ladies and gentlemen, is an engineering problem. It is not an architectural problem. This class is about ideas. You make your idea, and your engineer does it for you. Otherwise, you know what? Architects do this all the time. They change their engineers. They'll change their engineers till they get it right. I mean, this is a very scary thing. Another one. Somebody said, we want to put six astronauts on the moon, and we want to have, uh, we want to have them have fresh food all day long. And I go like, OK. What does it take to keep a person um, on good fresh food? How, how much land does it take? An acre? Two acres? Perhaps an acre in the Sun Belt? Maybe two acres up north, Northern California or further up north? You know what? The first thing that hit me is, where do we get that kind of space? You don't have that kind of space anywhere in any spacecraft. And you look at it. And you start to say, you can fold up things this way and that way and this way and that way. And you'll get about three acres of space. And then you start to say, well, that's not enough to keep three, six people. So double it. So you, <laughs> so you got two external tanks. I know I'm missing the ogive, but that's, that, that is artistic license here. And uh, you get to show them something where you could have, uh, you could have uh, uh, fresh food every day for six crew. Hotel, Mr. Bigelow might like that one. And what would it look if you put an external tank on the International Space Station? Very big. And uh, I know that we have with us at least one lecturer uh, who would like to see this. Boris Fritz is right there. And I'm happy to tell you, Boris, that next year the International Space Station will sport a rapid prototyping uh, um, module, a, a, a rack. And that was done for Buzz Aldrin. It is a cycling spacecraft, and, and you're looking at um, the idea that you could use parts of uh, the external uh, tank of, of, uh, of, the, of the space shuttle stack to do that. My own favorite one. Sometime in the next five or 10 years, 
five years, three years, a small rover will land on the moon. It will have on it an electromagnetic cannon. And it will have a bunch of pellets that look like so, about the size of a soup can. The rover would go down, drill little samples, core samples, encase it in that, in that capsule, and shoot it right back to planet Earth, where it'll come down like a meteorite, land in the Arctic area, and you'll go down there in a sled and pick it up, crack it open, and get your samples at about 100th the cost of what is proposed for sample return missions. Is that good enough? Uh, very good. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take one more here. This was a project done in our class of using terrestrial systems, thinking about terrestrial systems and their application for uh, space activities. The person who, who did this said, you know, I see a lot of tall buildings on the moon, but we don't see anybody how it's going to be constructed. Here you see a bucket truck made for, <laughs> for the lunar mission. And I'm glad to report to you that this student came back to the studio twice. He was not happy with the grade the first time. Came back the second time, took it, got the grade he liked. And you know what? I think he's going to be an astronaut, too. I will, I will stop with that. speak for how long because we've had so many emails 20 about this. minutes and then we'll have 10 minutes for questions okay all right good so how does this thing work Let me start it for you. <clears throat> Oh, left and right. OK, all right. So um, the title of my talk tonight is New Space Architecture. And when I heard that I would be on the panel with John and Madhu, I had to add a reality-based approach just so that you all would know the difference. <laughs> and, uh, um, so what do we mean by space architecture? Uh, you sure this thing works? Okay, so the working definition of space architecture is the design of space living and working environments, structures and configurations, plus the systems that make them viable and safe to operate. I mean, that's the definition that I use. So what is new space? New space is where you do it on your own nickel and take all the risk on yourself without government pork. OK. There we go. OK, so my company, Astrotecture, is the first professional practice of space architecture. And our focus is on research, planning, and design for all gravity regimes, extending the continuum of architecture from Earth to space, bringing space design down to Earth, and making the golden age of science fiction into a new reality. And I, I actually try to practice this, this bullet more than anything else, which is it's so hard to, to start a new business and make progress and, and win customers that uh, the, there's a, a real danger to taking yourself too seriously. So my goal is to like re do this by reliving my own golden age of science fiction and the comic books that I loved and not take any of this too seriously. Otherwise, I completely crack up. <laughs> Whoops. 
So the first actual substantial contract was with the University of North Dakota at their EPSCOR grant, which I don't remember what EPSCOR stands for, but basically it's a grant to encourage competitive research at space, through space grant universities, where I'm a consultant for their integrated habitat for the human exploration of Moon and Mars. Then uh, I'm on two NIAC grants, the uh, Robotic Asteroid Prospector and the Water Walls Life Support Arc. In the mid-90s, he has been uh, <clears throat> designing his original concept for an orbital super yacht called Destiny. He is the author with Karen Rag of the first book on space tourism published in the U.S. called Space Tourism, Do You Want to Go? He founded the Space Tourism Society in 1995 and is being quoted and appeared in over 100 TV and radio shows, newspaper and magazines, articles on space tourism. So, welcome, John. <laughs> Next, uh, Jason Classy. Uh, Jason is an Emmy uh, nominated documentary producer and author. His productions have uh, premiered on television at the United Nations and events around the world. NASA, <clears throat> the International Astronautical Congress, and Paramount Pictures have published Jason's writings. Jason is a recipient of the Space Tourism Society's Orbit Award. He is the founder and president of Expedition Earth, a 501c3 corporation and Space Traveler, Inc. So welcome, Jason. <laughs> And uh, last but not least, uh, welcome Madhu Tangavelo. Uh, Madhu conducts the Graduate Space Exploration Architecture Concept uh, Synthesis Studio in the Department of Astronautical Engineering at USC. He also taught the Extreme Environment Habitation Design Seminar in the School of Architecture, where he's a graduate thesis advisor. He's a graduate of the inaugural summer session of the International Space University held at MIT in 1988. I find this very interesting. Yes, and I'm <laughs> glad to tell you we have faculty members here. And we do have faculty members. Uh, maybe you, 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 you will introduce them. I, I will leave that to you. Um, Madhu's concepts have been uh, <clears throat> reviewed and appreciated by NASA, the National Research Council, the National Space Council, and his work has been presented before the National Academy of Sciences. He is a visiting lecturer at ISU and continues to present and publish original concepts in space system architectures. He is a co-author of the book, The Moon, Resources, Future Development, and Colonization. He is a former vice chairman for education of the AIAA Los Angeles section. And uh, he has directed space exploration projects <clears throat> at the California Institute of Earth, Art, and Architecture. So welcome, Madhu. <laughs> and uh, so it is now my pleasure to officially uh, leave the word to you. And uh, we will start with Dr. Marcoin. Thank you very much. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, just, just so everybody knows, uh, Nicola, I, I speak for how long they design and make their own suits as well and uh, this I, I, I've never really understood why it has such small wheels I brought this up time and again but they seem to think that for the purpose of their simulation this will be this will be sufficient they're not they're not actually interested in in the problem of four a four wheel or six wheel drive over extremely rough terrain they're much more focused on the the interface with the suits and the suit port and the living inside the rover for some period of a few days. Okay, so <coughs> the next project I became engaged in was the, uh, the NIAC project um, robotic asteroid prospector. And I put together a team which includes a mineral economist, Brad Blair, a uh, mission design and trajectories guy, Warren James, who lives nearby in Altadena, and a co I for mining and robotics, Chris Acne of uh, Honeybee Robotics, who is also in Pasadena. So one of the things we did to develop our approach was, we call this our space infrastructural approach or strategy, was to try to figure out what would be the development of a market in, for space 
products in space because the fundamental economic divide is whether you're bringing the products back to Earth or whether you have a customer in space. And the purpose of this chart and, and the analysis that underlies it is to look at the whole issue of the customer in space. So not to go into too much detail here because it's probably too small for you to read, we set up a time interval of 15 years, baseline starting in 2010, and made some assumptions about how much money might be invested in developing space infrastructure. This is private money. And uh, I can't even read it myself. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the, the rate of investment as measured in NASA yearly budgets. So we took that as, as, as a sort of a fungible unit, if you will, that, that a NASA budget being about 16 to 17 billion dollars a year, how much of how large a fraction of that would might be invested per year by private parties in space infrastructure development. The number of people living in space with there being six on the space station around the end of 2010 and that doubling or increasing by a little more than doubling or it actually grows exponentially on this chart. How many would be living in space? And then where, what kinds of products or commodities and where they might be consumed? And the products we were looking at were um, architecture. NIAC stands for NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts. So this is the situation in North Dakota, which is that there was a previous incumbent as consultants who designed this habitat for them with this uh, Takanaka Trust type um, space frame that was restraining the inflatable. And it was a nifty looking design, but the problem was that the cost of machining high strength forgings <coughs> in titanium to make the nodes and struts would have exceeded the entire value of their grant to, to make this possible. So, so he left and they hired me. And this, what they actually did um, before I came on board was they decided to make this frame out of a welded tubular steel. And here you see a couple views of that, of that habitat frame. And they hadn't decided what to do about the inflatable. And I'm actually still not sure what they're going to do. But this is what it looks like after I got involved and helped them with a lot of the um, issues of you know, outfitting and furnishing and life safety and you know, real basic architectural kinds of things. And uh, so anyway, um, they are planning to take this habitat and their rover for a field trial in September in the North Dakota Badlands. Now, as far as the rover goes, uh, Pablo de Leon, who's the, the lead on this grant um, at North Dakota, became enamored of the support concept, which is one of my patents from, <coughs> from my checkered career at Ames. And the basic concept is that you enter the suit through a pressure bulkhead and it's basically an airlockless airlock where you don't have to pump down the airlock to save atmosphere or equalize pressure. Just the crew member can just hop in, close the hatch, bleed off the interstitial volume and go. So in the 90s, we built the Ames Hazmat vehicle, which was, uh, we got an, the loan of an armored personnel carrier and we built a couple of prototypes into the back of it. And this was funded by, um, by the Army and the Department of Energy and NASA. <coughs> While I was at North of Grumman, we, we pursued as an option a suit port for uh, arrangement for the Altair airlock. And some of you may have noticed during the President's first inauguration that the NASA float was the so-called lunar electric rover driven by astronauts in the, in the uh, inaugural parade. So here's the North Dakota version. Um, they actually
I would like to move to our event uh, tonight and introduce to you our distinguished uh, panel speakers. Um, and um, I, I, I will go uh, straight to the bios uh, so we don't lose time. But I guess first we want to invite our panel speakers at the, at, at the panel. Please come over. This is, this is the moment. You can, you can get all set here. So welcome our panel speakers. So we'll have Mark here. We want to go on. I will uh, be very brief, and uh, I, I'll only give you a summary. Uh, the full bios are on our uh, registration website, um, if you're interested. And I really encourage you to go there and check them out. Uh, <clears throat> I will start uh, uh, with Dr. Mark Cohen. Uh, Dr. Mark Cohen uh, is a licensed architect uh, who has uh, devoted his career to developing the new field of space architecture. Mark worked at, uh, at NASA Ames Research Center for 26 years, then at Northrop Grumman Aerospace Systems for four and a half years. At Ames, Mark became a founding member of the uh, Space Human Factors Office. Mark also patented the nodes and cupola of the space station. In 1995, he went uh, to the Space Projects Division to serve as the human engineering lead uh, for SOFIA. I hope I pronounced it right. There, he worked uh, also on Humans to Mars and the Habot Mobile Lunar Base. <clears throat> At Northrop Grumman, uh, Mark's major focus was the Constellation Program's Alter Lunar Lander, for which he was the Human System Integration Lead. Mark is now developing his company, Astrotecture. The goal is to provide expertise to the new emerging entrepreneurial space companies while continuing to lend support to NASA and the mainstream aerospace industry. Uh, welcome, Mark Cohen. Thank you very much. And I'm going to move to John. I'm going to do, uh, do all of the bios very quickly. <clears throat> uh, John Spencer, welcome. Uh, since the late uh, 1970s, uh, John has been pioneering the field of space um, architecture. He received design awards from NASA for early work on the Freedom Space Station. <clears throat> and was involved in the startup of SpaceHab. <clears throat> he has an extensive background in spaceport planning and design and designed the interiors for an underwater hab lab, still in operation, and a science base built in Antarctica. In 1992, he started pioneering the space tourism industry, basing it on the cruise line industry. <clears throat> and since the